thanks everybody again. Uh, people here at Peshitta and uh, people online. Very kind of you to take your time out for this. We look at it one way from the perspective of the teachings of the tradition, then we are unbelievably uh, fortunate. There are uh, apparently eons of time where the word Buddha is not heard, let alone the words emptiness, bodhicitta, happiness, you know, of, high, of upper realms. Uh, these words are not even heard. So uh, we're living at a time when, although the Buddha himself, the historical Buddha is not with us, uh, the teachings are there. And we still very fortunate to have some uh, realized people, some realized great masters who can uh, teach authentically from their experience. Uh, not just the words. People like me just know the words, some of the words, but there are people who have the realizations. And so uh, they are still among us and still teaching. So we're very fortunate. We're also fortunate, of course, because we are able to understand, listen to these teachings, uh, isn't it? Because we are human beings. And uh, so that is another great fortune. And we are human beings, let us remember, who are not in a state of tremendous deprivation or suffering. We're not suffering from a war conflict. We're not suffering right now from being a refugee or for being uh, starving or being afflicted by a terrible sickness. You know, we are not afflicted by any of these things right now. We're not, uh, you know, um, in a jail. We're not in an overcrowded jail with a lot of unhappy, frustrated, violent people. You know, well, you could say, yeah, society is a kind of jail, but we're not in, uh, you know, in a jail which is uh, 100 people to a cell and one toilet or something. We're not in that situation. Many people are. And of course, we are not animals. Those of us listening here, we're not animals. So we have this incredible ability to uh, understand the Dharma. That's another great fortune. We are in a place where we are allowed to listen to the Dharma, you know, uh, where it is not something we have to engage in in secret uh, for fear of being persecuted or even, I don't know, jailed or something. So we're not in what are called barbarian lands where the dharma is not uh, existing. We have all our sense faculties intact. So we are free of all kinds of disturbances, all kinds of restricting conditions. We have um, facilities, meaning at the moment we have the texts, we have the centers like Toshita, we have the equipment to listen in, even if we can't be here in person. We have all of this. So starting from what I began with, you know, with, uh, with the Buddha being around and his teachings being still there and up to all these factors, it's an extraordinary set of circumstances. You know? Plus there's the interest we have. We had time to able to congregate here together. So this is not something to take for granted you know, for any of us. Um, yeah, and, and although we may uh, you know, feel that it's a shame there isn't a very realized teacher here, it's true, but at least uh, we have the ability to together investigate and sh you know, talk about, share the precious teachings of the Buddha. So this is something extraordinary when you look at how many people are spending their lives, it is something really marvelous. I don't have to tell you how people are spending their lives. You can see it. Uh, most, you know. So, <clears throat> and the reason this is very important is because from a Buddhist perspective, mind is beginningless and endless. And what we're doing now is planting seeds that can help us long term. 
not just today, not just tomorrow, not just till the end of our lives, like a good insurance policy, far beyond that, into the death, into death, into the intermediate state, into the next life and future lives. This dharma helps us all the way. And if authentic dharma, it does not cheat us, cannot cheat us, like everything else does, the body, people, cheat us in the sense they come and go and they can behave very strangely and uh, yeah actually also uh, deceive us and uh, leave us separate from us but if we're careful then the dharma will never separate from us it is the most precious um, most precious phenomena in the world in the universe if what we want is lasting peace and satisfaction. If what we want is suffering, then of course, there are many other things we can do and are doing. So this is just to remind myself and all of us that uh, we don't need, we shouldn't take this for granted, this opportunity. Because death is just around the corner, right? In one sense meaning it doesn't take much to die. It doesn't have to be a war. It doesn't have to be an earthquake. It can be something much less than that for us to die. You know? So uh, and since we don't know probably when that's going to happen, we can uh, take advantage now. We must take advantage now. Yeah. What else can we do? So, yes. Uh, and then the other aspect of motivating, getting our mind prepared, which is what we're doing now, like a good gardener, preparing the soil of their garden so that the seeds that are planted will flourish and grow. Uh, the other aspect, of course, of the motivation is compassion, great compassion, remembering our own suffering, our own uh, quest for happiness and how it has not yet been fulfilled. For lasting contentment, nowhere near fulfilled right now, despite the fact that according to Lord Buddha, we have the potential to become fully awakened and therefore fully in a state of great bliss forever. That's not happened yet. So that and the fact that everybody else we know pretty much is in that situation, which is very sad. And we see how people are. We see often people struggling to be happy, struggling for satisfaction, trying so desperately with all kinds of means, you know, relationships, food, money, power, prestige, status, you know, you name it, uh, accumulating property, and this and that, and whatever, not finding satisfaction, not finding any kind of final satisfaction, often just creating more and more confusion, isn't it? Confusion and pain. And uh, a lot of botheration for others as well. So this is uh, something not so sad. It, it, it wouldn't be sad if what we wanted was suffering. Then it would be okay, but we don't want suffering. patient who comes to the doctor doesn't want to be sick. Doctor is often can't do much because the patient does not take the medicine properly and lives a life where they're going to get sick all the time. Hmm. So think for a little while about people you know or anything in the world right now or historically that has moved you and made you feel about, you know, made you feel for the suffering, the pain of others in some very deep way, not just the superficial way. Try to arouse that uh, feeling, memory, and think uh, how wonderful it would be if these beings could be free of that. And just confusion and pain. 
individual level, family, collective level. I'm ending. And then arouse that uh, bodhisattva, bodhicitta spirit, which says not only how wonderful it would be if they were all happy, uh, free of the suffering and the causes of it, but I myself will try and do something about this. I will enable them to be free of suffering and its causes. I will help them create happiness and its causes in whatever way I can. I, I, I must do that. I will do that. This would be the best use of my precious human life. You Buddhist or take on refuge, you can visualize Lord Buddha or Tara or the Medicine Buddha in space in front of you. If not, no problem, just you can visualize a source of light. If you are a Christian, one would uh, enjoin you to visualize Christ or Mother Mary, whatever. So this source of compassion you can uh, visualize, a source which symbolizes compassion, wisdom in front of you, and much light coming, and blessing us, purifying us of everything that uh, prevents us from actualizing this great compassionate mind. Much light, and nectar coming from the heart of the Buddha, Avalokiteshvara, medicine Buddha, Tara, whoever we choose. Bara being the female embodiment, enlightenment of enlightened energy, very quick enlightened energy. Feel that light is streaming into us and all of our fears, all of our resistance to opening up and generating the universal sublime heart of great compassion. All of that is washed away. All the hindrances to that, all of the garbage in the mind, all of the wrong thinking, all of the doubts and fears, all of the aggression which comes from trying to protect the self, the me, the I, the mind, all of that washed away. the body and mind becoming light, much more light, blissful. The light nectar washes away this internal garbage, baggage that we don't need anymore. Burdening us since beginningless time. Feel that light is also spreading and reaching all the suffering living beings, all the kind motherly beings who 
like us want to be happy, don't want to suffer. Feel great happiness, feel great rejoicing, feel that one does have the potential, one does, one is able, one will be able to be of benefit to others. Possible, definitely, it will happen. Pray, aspire to be like Buddha, like Tara. May I become like you, just like you, fully awakened. infinite compassion without boundaries, tremendous insight, wisdom, understanding things as they are, seeing everything, sarvajani, and having the skillful means and the power to benefit others. Then think in order to actualize this, I'll need not only to have the, you know, <clears throat> to actualize this great state of awakening, I will need wisdom, the wisdom that understands things as they are. For that, I'll need to tame my mind to the extent that it will be calm, clear, focused on the basis of a balanced way of life, good way of life is rejected, which has given up harming others in any way. So now we can practice uh, the uh, breath awareness to collect, calm the mind, bring the mind home, create a sense of peace, attentional stability, very soothing for the body and mind, but also helps us generate more clarity, mental stability. Which preparation for going deeper with the wisdom practices, especially. Let's spend some time quietly being aware of breath, Disturbances come, if distractions come, we just let them go. We notice, we let go calmly, carefully, relax to it, and bring the mind back to the breath. Sense of letting go and releasing of the outcome.
stillness in the body, relax, very awake. Focusing thoughts, distractions, recognizing, letting go, back to the breath. The sensation of breath with the nostrils as we breathe in and out. For just a short time like that, sitting, we can see all the three aspects of uh, what we have been talking about the last few sessions and are continuing with today. Those three aspects being, how, how does one create the cause of happiness? Uh, what is What do we mean by arrogance and the aggression of the self, grasping? What do we mean by habitual patterns? We can see all these factors 
we can begin to understand all these three factors when we experience what happens in our mind when we try to practice the breath when there's the habitual pattern of uh, drifting off into thought, past, future, fears, expectations, events that happened today, yesterday, WhatsApp messages come into the mind, whatever. So many things come and go based on our habitual pattern. There may have been moments, very brief moments of relative clarity or calm without a thought. You may have understood how not following a thought immediately, not reacting to it, but letting it go, coming back to the breath is actually a kind of a release, a kind of a cutting of that chain of uh, relentless, almost uncontrolled mental activity, which we usually engage in, in the form of uh, distracted wandering thoughts. And in terms of the what we call the arrogance of the ego, arrogance here meaning that when we do have this strong sense of I, me, mine, or even a subtle sense of it, then there is a sense of division between ourselves and the object, other, if it's a person, or the breath, or anything, there's that sense of a division between me, I, the meditator, and the object. And there's a subtle aggression starts at that point, because either what we are doing is something which is pleasant or unpleasant. And if it's neutral, we get bored. If it's pleasant, we want more. If it's unpleasant, we want to push it away. So that also comes up, doesn't it, in, in the practice. There could be a pain in the body, and then instantaneously, the I, we, we, we identify with a me who is observing, who is aware of this pain and doesn't like the pain, wants to separate from the pain. Is not able to be with the pain, for example, or watch the pain, but wants to get rid of the pain. So this is the subtle aggression. We have to also realize that language can be used in many ways. We have to see how language can be used in different ways. Aggression doesn't mean, or arrogance doesn't mean full-blown arrogant attitude like a person who's a leader or a politician or something. It doesn't have to be like that. Aggression doesn't have to be you know, with a knife or a gun or punching someone. There can be very subtle aggression, aversion, you could say, wanting to push something away, not wanting, not liking. So this also comes up, doesn't it, in the practice? Not wanting the pain, not just not wanting to be sitting here still, maybe. Uh, not liking, not wanting a thought that's come up some event or something that's happening in one's life, not liking it, or wanting it. See, there's a, there's a subtle aggression in wanting, don't you think? Meaning, I want, I must have, I need, I want. That's not relaxed and calm. It's a form of subtle roughness in the mind which is uh, actually one of the definitions of, uh, or part of definition of delusions in general. It is uh, something that makes the mind rough. This is a very general definition. So aggression, anger, attachment, we've listened to the definitions over the years, but also last week, but a very rough way of saying it is, yeah, delusions make the mind rough, rough and uh, not smooth, not calm. That's the function of delusion. So anger, attachment, ignorance, pride, jealousy, deluded, doubt, all these factors, they make the mind rough. Make it troubled, you could say. It's like wave. 
make the dust rise. It's rough. It's not calm, clear, and smooth. It's not like a placid lake where you can see the trees and mountains clearly reflected in it. No, the delusions make the mind, the lake, rough, like wind. Inclement weather. So I don't know if uh, I'm making sense, but we can uh, see that from this simple practice of trying to watch the breath just for a few minutes. It's not easy. Habitual patterns also can arise in just constantly feeling uh, weary or drowsy when we have to engage in anything internal like this with, with focus. It's not easy. There's a, a factor of impatience also comes in. We are used to, uh, we want more, in, you know, more excitement, more drama in our lives. More tamasha, we call it here, more, more of a circus going on. You know, like a, a modern, well, at least Bollywood movie which when people aren't killing each other or shouting, they are dancing, that kind of thing. We want constant action. We want uh, instant entertainment all the time, with, whether it's cricket or, or anything. And those of you who like cricket, which is, of course, a very sad day for India, having lost to Australia last night, but you'll have noticed, those of you who are old enough, that cricket has changed quite a bit from being... Uh, test match scenario, which would take four or five days, quite leisurely, often so leisurely that you wonder what's happening out there in the middle. Uh, people are very relaxedly bowling and uh, playing defensive shots. There's no, uh, there's not much uh, you know, action sometimes, it seems, in test cricket. But that's gone now. Now we want uh, one-day internationals. Everything's over quite quickly. And uh, even 20 over cricket. My point is, we're in a, an, an era which has speeded up intensely, and we are craving excitement, craving entertainment, craving something you know, which grabs our attention, happening every 10 seconds. So to sit and watch the breath, this is so boring, right? It can be so boring. Those of us who are used to having the smartphone by our side and not having it on silent very much, but then constant uh, distraction, constant entertainment. Yeah. So <clears throat> one way of looking at the habitual patterns also is to see the self-cherishing attitude as a, as a habitual pattern as a whole. We speak of uh, the self-cherishing attitude which here means a state of mind that regards oneself as very important, the most important, and which does not, and therefore which regards others as simply uh, a means for us to gain satisfaction, a pleasure, and get what we want. That's the role of others in our life with the self cherishing attitude. So, that also has become a habitual pattern for us. It's built up of uh, many, many different patterns rolled into one. All of them, of course, based on what we might call the primordial habitual pattern of grasping onto I, me, mine. That has also become a habitual pattern for us. Although habitual pattern usually refers, we usually re use that term to refer to the effects of the cell of, of uh, ignorance, the effects being the different ways we protect ourselves, the different habits we use to hide our fear, to entertain ourselves, to get what we want, to maintain a sense of, uh, of uh, a real me, you know, which keep us feeling secure, which keep the cocoon of our life, uh, you know, uh, going. So we don't have to, you know, go down too many untrodden paths, you know, which would be dangerous. So all of these habitual patterns, usually they are 
the, the, the original ignorance itself is not regarded as habitual pattern. But of course it is, it's been going on for a long time. But technically, uh, the self-grasping ignorance is not called the, uh, the uh, you know, self-grasping ignorance is not called the habitual pattern. That's the primordial kind of delusion we have. It's a delusion, the root delusion. But it can be useful to see how the way we protect ourselves, care for ourselves, instinctively is number one, usually, that becomes very habitual. It's something we do naturally. And even though it causes a lot of pain, and we may not understand what I just said, we might say, no, this is the way actually we gain happiness. This is the way I maintain myself by putting myself first. But think about it. Think about what it entails to put oneself first all the time and to be thinking about oneself all the time. What does that mean? Is it a satisfactory, calm, peaceful state of mind to have? Or is it rather something that produces something else? This is something to think about. Does concern for oneself really bring the happiness we seek? Is it a calm, clear, peaceful state of mind? This we have to investigate. I'm not going to give any easy answers. I don't have any easy answers. It's for us to investigate. Uh, some teachers would say, my own teacher used to say, uh, if uh, you know, that real happiness, and I've quoted this many times before, real happiness in life begins when you start to cherish others, and brackets more than oneself, which is not said, it's taken for granted, but that's what it means. Real happiness in life is not right now when we're taking care of ourselves. Real happiness in life starts when we begin to cherish others, deeply and sincerely caring for others, and not caught up with me, I, me, mine all the time. Actually, it's perfect common sense, but often we don't see it. It's perfect psychology in many ways. Even for someone whom you might say is sick or in a depression, the more we think about our sickness or our depression or the problems we're having, that is not going to solve it. That is, you know, constantly thinking of ourselves. How is that going to solve the problem? It just makes it worse. But if we were to start thinking about other people sincerely and what they need, their suffering, which is often far more than ours, let's face it, then what would happen? Interesting to go down that line of thought and to actually check it out, try it sometime. What would happen if we began to really pay attention to what other people need? Or even actually really just start to pay attention to something like uh, what's happening right now, or making a cup of tea, or going for a quiet little walk and paying attention to the trees and the leaves and the ground. It was amazing. Today I was walking down the side of Orbindo Marg. It was a very, very busy road in Delhi going north-south, pretty much. And it, it goes through the area uh, where Kashita is, where I live. So I was on the uh, western side of that road walking north, and this uh, this animal, which I'm almost absolutely sure was like a, uh, which it wasn't a squirrel. We have a lot of squirrels in the trees, very small one. But this was, a, this was a mongoose crossing the path in front of me next to a main road where there's all this traffic shooting past at, uh, it was about 10, 20, 10, 25 a.m. So certainly not a quiet time of day. And there's this mongoose goes across the path. It's like, wow. So there's so many things one could pay attention to and which would take our mind off our own, huh, what one teacher has said rather controversially, our own miserable little lives, you know. Miserable in the sense small. Small how? Limited. Me, 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 my little, my, my little world. The other things were just peripheral. You know, my little world, my problem. 
my this, my that. That's a kind of miserable little world. Cocoon. One teacher calls it a cocoon. We're in our little cocoon. And we have so many thoughts connected with our cocoon that we are binding ourselves tighter and tighter and tighter into a knot uh, where it's very hard to, you know, to get untied. see this in ourselves, sometimes we see it more clearly in other people, how they get tied up with, uh, with certain you know, habits, knots composed of actions, thoughts, feelings. Act, you know, we can see how this happens for people, including ourselves. Yeah, tying ourselves in knots. Uh, so that's a painful way to live. And it's not the op, you know, it's not, we don't have to live that way. According to the teachings, we don't have to live that way. Why? Because our mind is naturally not that way, actually, you know. It is not tight and crowded and full of dukkha by nature. By nature, mind is clear, knowing, it is spacious, it is like the sky. And we, insist on filling it up with dark clouds and distractions. But it's not necessarily like that. It is not like that. Its fundamental nature is quite different. It's spatial. In the nature of what some teachings call light, clear light. So <clears throat> we need to rethink look cl closely at how we how we are living in this world right how we are perceiving things and how that might and how we are taking care of this what some teachers would say is a hallucination we're taking care of something that doesn't actually exist we're trying to protect something that doesn't exist in the way we think it is it's i it's me think it's so very solid so we try to take care of it as though we're carrying around a, a, a big jewel which has to be protected from thieves <clears throat> let's have a little story as an in, in, intermission uh, Tibetan lamas always give stories to uh, to entertain and to but always with a message in it it's not uh, this is um, a story from Lama Zopinpache, uh, which he loved to quote a few times, and it's in his book, Joy of Compassion. Uh, it's not direct, well, everything's related to everything, but, and it is related to our topic. We'll talk about it after I've read the story. He's talking about a situation that happened near the great stupa of uh, Bauda which is in Nepal, one of the very great largest stupas in the, the largest, I can't think of a larger one in the Himalayan region. Uh, it's a vast region, right? If you start up in the Pakistan area and you then have Ladakh and go all the way to Bhutan, then that's a very wide, very long region. Yeah, This is the biggest stupa there, which is a source of uh, much activity. And um, Hmm. There are a few stories here. Actually, three little stories. I hope you don't mind. Three little anecdotes regarding a very great teacher, uh, one of uh, Rinpoche's teachers, His Holiness uh, Serpong Tsensok Rinpoche, talking about one of his teachers, Serpong Dorje Chang. Anyway, here's uh, the first story, and which is actually. Uh, connected with a pilgrimage to Bodhga. And then the second story will be related with something happening near the great stupa. The second two stories happening near the great stupa of uh, Bodha, just outside Kathmandu. Once Serkon Gorje Chang was traveling to Bodhga, perhaps on pilgrimage or for teachings from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and his monk's robes 
uh, the required yellow ones, uh, the outer robes, so that so that ones which they use especially for teachings or ceremonies, they were left in a taxi in Patna. Yeah, they were left in a taxi in Patna. Later, when his attendant told Rinpoche that they had been lost or stolen, he said, oh, that's very good, meaning that he was happy that the thieves might get some use out of them, uh, that it was worthwhile that they'd been stolen. The next story <clears throat> is concerning some monks who uh, had been given money by their benefactor to invite a particular lama, a very great lama called Gupta Rinpoche. The benefactor, the sponsor wanted Gupta Rinpoche to come and give teachings and some precepts to these monks at a, at a little uh, gompa, very close to uh, the Bodhanath Stupa. But the, these monks had a different idea. They heard that this great teacher Serkong Rinpoche was in town. So they discarded the wishes of the sponsor uh, and decided, you know, because, oh, this other teacher is such a great teacher, we must invite him. Although actually Gruptop Rinpoche was uh, more connected to those monks and their guru, you could say. But they invited Serkong Rinpoche to come and give the teaching. Okay, understand? The sponsor wanted this other lama. The monks thought, no, oh, the Serkong Rinpoche is more famous. We must have him. So they invited Serkong Rinpoche. And then this happened. So he was supposed to give the eight Mahayana precepts, which is eight precepts that you are given for 24 hours which also involved not, uh, not uh, eating more than once that day, not singing or dancing, playing music, as well as the other five basic precepts. So what happened? They invited him. So he came in, carrying the text of the precepts, and he sat down. He opened it, and this is what he said to these monks. He said, if your guru tells you to lick fresh, hot kaka, then you get down on the ground immediately and you lick it. Then with his tongue outstretched and making a slurping sound, he imitated a dog licking up excrement. Understand? Understand what's going on? In case you might think, oh, what's happening? He's, he was teaching, he was reading from a Buddhist book and the strange stories coming out. You understand? He said, if your, if your guru takes you to, tells you to lick kaka, turd, right, feces, then you get down on the ground immediately and lick it. And then he imitated dog licking kaka. That's how to practice dharma, he said. Then he left. So they got up and left. He didn't give them the teaching they wanted. That was the motivation, Lama Zopran said, that he gave us before precepts. It was like an atomic explosion a very powerful teaching. And, and I think Lama Zopran was there. It's not that he just heard that teaching. He was there. Just on the basis of that instruction, Rinpoche said, I took him as my guru. I decided that Kong Rinpoche is my guru. I need that kind of guru who gives that kind of teaching. It really moved the mind. Just on the basis of that, I took him as a guru. That's all he taught that morning. But he's somebody who knows everything. He's a great yogi. Then the next story, the last story. Okay. So Serkong Dorje Chang, this teacher, would often go around, circumambulate the Holy Stupa at Bauda. Oh, sorry, at Swayambuna. Sorry, this is Swayambuna. Okay, that's a smaller stupa on the western side of Kathmandu. The uh, Bauda is on the eastern side of Kathmandu. This is on the west. It's on a hill. It's often called the Monkey Temple because there are many monkeys there. Wonderful place. Different energy from Bauda. Very, very, very holy stupa there. Swayambu. Self-original stupa. So he, it's the original, actually. It's the main original holy object in Kathmandu, according to Lama Sopra. Okay. So people who didn't know who he was or the qualities he embodied, he would just appear as a simple monk. They'd think he knew nothing. 
simple monk, mala, rosary in his hand, circumambulating the stupa. That's how he appeared. He might have appeared like he knew nothing, but in reality, he knew everything. So then Rinpoche says, Lama with a touch of humor, he says here, sometimes he'd be circumambulating with all the other people. If the time was right, if it was their lucky day, he'd suddenly turn to a complete stranger and say, you don't have much longer to live, or you're going to die in a month. He would go up to someone and say that. Great, huh? So better do prostrations with the 35 Buddhas. Something like that. Rinpoche would make a prediction and advise the people what to do. But if the time wasn't right, if it was not the day of your good fortune, even if you asked him something directly, you'd say, oh, I, I know nothing. I'm completely ignorant. So there are many stories like that but about great lamas, what they do when their things are lost or stolen, how they can be very wrathful, in a very powerful way to people who don't follow their guru's advice and think they're being very clever by inviting some high lama instead, when the money they are using is from a sponsor who wants the other lama, you know? And to this story where he could go up to people and tell them, because he had clairvoyance, he knew things. You're going to die in a month. How would you react if someone came up to you and said that? At least it would shake your mind. And then probably that person would check who is this guy. They would find out. Anyway, that's Serpong uh, Soje uh, Chang. He's uh, I received teachings from his one of his students, or sorry, one of his teachers, Serkong uh, Senshab Serkong Soje Chang, which means the teacher of Serkong. <coughs> Serkong means anyway. He's uh, very great lamas, very great lamas. So these are some stories to entertain us and wake us up. Um, such lamas maybe don't exist so much anymore who would say things like that or teach like that. Maybe they exist. Maybe They know that if they say things like that nowadays, people will just get angry or sue them or whatever, accuse them of misconduct. But in the old days, older days, lamas would say these things and people would understand maybe nowadays it's, it's, you know I, I imagine nowadays if a lama started beating up the student like uh, marpa beat up milarepa instantly a whole bunch of people would be there to help the person who's beaten up and institute cases against uh, the, the guru so of course we don't know we can't judge sometimes what's going on right most of the time, it is said we do not judge correctly what's going on. Mainly because we don't know the mind of the other person. That's the main reason. We don't know what's going on in other people's minds. Unless we have clairvoyance. We just judge by some action they're doing. We can't tell. I'll stop here. I'm going on a long time. Uh, I did want to quote something. Both of it. <clears throat> yeah, something connected with this word arrogance and uh, the aggression part. We've been talking about the aggression that comes from is going to have to come if we have this strong sense of I. Even if we think we're a very gentle, kind person, which we might be, but if there's that sense of I that can come up strongly, then there's going to also be aggression, aversion. Even if it's very subtle, it's there and it's an obstacle. We tend to think that the threats to our society or to ourselves are outside of us. We fear that some enemy will destroy us. 
but a society is destroyed from the inside, not from an attack by outsiders. We ima may imagine the enemy coming with spears and machine guns to kill us, to massacre us, but in reality, the only thing that can destroy us is within ourselves. Let's be talking a long time. And, uh, and at a deep level, at a deeper level. If we have too much arrogance, we will destroy our gentleness. If we destroy gentleness, we destroy the possibility of being awake. And then we cannot use our intuitive openness to extend ourselves in situations properly. Instead, we will generate tremendous aggression. So he's saying, he's implying, isn't he? We all have an intuitive openness, which is connected with our Buddha nature. A warmth, an openness, all of these things are there within us, you could say, within the Buddha nature, to speak in rough terms. But if we harbor aggression, if we destroy gentleness, then we destroy being awake, the possibility of really being awake and aware, and then we won't be able to access the intuitive openness and the ability to extend to other people properly, skillfully, without aggression. We won't be able to do that. And often one feels strongly the aggression. Haji, thank you. Thank you, Sarishji. Afka. She sandwiched her time talking. <laughs> Thank you. Niraji ko pranam kariji. So, we can have some discussion now. I've spoken a lot, too much as usual. Sorry. Ji. Skylight. Yeah, skylight. Well, the most very subtle, the most subtle level of consciousness. Yeah. How, how is it related to the uh, I think we can access the direct understanding, of course. First of all, let's say we can develop an in, a inferential understanding of emptiness, right? Through the Madhyamaka reasoning, but which would, to be powerful, I guess, involve having very good, uh, clear concentration, attention. I doubt it could come to someone if their mind is uh, not yet rather tamed with shamatha, let's say. So that is the inferential understanding. And you are referring to the direct uh, perception of emptiness, right, yeah. in, in meditation. So obviously that comes from sustained, uh, at least according to the Gelukpa school, I suppose, sustained uh, inferential understanding and you know, entering into meditation again and again with the reasonings and looking at you know, what we call the object to be negated, this sense of an inherently existing I and so forth, doing that again and again and uh, creating more and more merit through other activities that we're engaging in, like serving the guru, and cross, you know, accumulating merit, uh, purifying, uh, uh, purifying mistakes, purifying the mind of uh, impurities. And then that becomes deeper, deeper, deeper. And then we have a direct realization of emptiness, which could last just a split second. And so then, how do we extend that? Well, I think the different schools of Tibetan Buddhism would approach it slightly differently. You know, and you can see I'm speaking in general terms and tentatively because I have not studied it enough to be able to say categorically what the other schools say. 
but I think within the Gelugpa school, we would not say that just because you have realized emptiness directly, you have then uh, access, continuous access to the clear light consciousness. No. What we have to look at, and this is a very interesting question, because one monk asked His Holiness about emptiness and so forth. He said, the Gelugpa school of Tibetan Buddhism is wonderful at describing uh, the objective emptiness, what is perceived, you know, when we realize emptiness, yeah, the objective emptiness in a sense. He said, Nyingma school excels, or is very useful in how it describes the subjective mind that is experiencing emptiness. So this is to be investigated whether that subjective mind has to be uh, in a state of clear light, I don't think so. Uh, long term, yeah, then they speak of Rikpa, don't they? In the non gelukpa schools, they speak of uh, Rikpa, natural or deep awareness, non-conceptual wakefulness. Non-conceptual wakefulness is one term that uh, Maybe similar terms were used in their tradition, speaking from a Nyingma point. So this non-conceptual wakefulness, that uh, if that mind is cultivated more and more, then uh, then there would be understanding, deeper and deeper understanding of uh, emptiness from a non-conceptual point of view, not just inferential, but direct, yeah? direct. They speak of, I think, the Rikpa as being a union of emptiness and clarity, clarity and emptiness. But this, you, we, you have to study more. I have to study more. It's not really something we can go into deeply here. There's some good books on that. Yeah. Can one, uh, one exist without the other? Can object direct realization exist without the, without the realization of uh, open space? Let's see if let's see if Ajirji has something to say on this. Ajirji, are you ready to uh, field uh, to uh, to bat against a, a, a very powerful googly from uh, from uh, our friend uh, Vishad Bhai? Yeah. Are you uh, are you willing to face this bowler? Oh, sorry, I have to allow you to speak. Sorry, how can you speak if you're not allowed to speak? Yeah, Ajay. Kabirji, could you please repeat the question? Sorry, Ajayji. Yes, we will repeat the question. So to understand, to have a direct perception of emptiness, does one need, does the subjective mind need to be in a state of what is it you called it? Spacious, skylike. Uh, does it need to be coming from the purest, deepest, skylike, uh, clear light nature of mind? And then vice versa, you said, if one is abiding in the clear light nature of mind, are we at that point directly perceiving emptiness? Is yeah. that, yeah? yeah and also, uh, can, can, if we are seeing direct, uh, if we are seeing emptiness directly, if we are seeing emptiness directly, uh, we also, at the same time, we are also abiding in that nature. Are we, are we also, at the same time, simultaneously abiding in which nature? Uh, the, clear light. the clear light nature. Can okay. we two exist without uh, another being present? Uh, yeah, can one exist without the other being present? So the clear light nature of mind and the uh, direct uh, uh, perception, direct, um, yeah, perception of emptiness. Bit of a googly, right? Or maybe not so difficult for Nalanda Master, Master's program students. Naveenji, do you wanna take a, do you want to face this bowl, this bowl? Kabirji. What is, uh... Yeah, uh, Vishad, uh, when you say direct relation, 
what does it mean for you? When you say direct what? Let's do what we did yesterday. I'll come down. Ah. Di he, ah, I you were direct realization. Yeah. A, di a direct realization, he means, of emptiness. Does it mean you have to be abiding in the clear light state of mind to understand that, uh, to have that direct realization of emptiness? Here's the culprit. <laughs> Your voice is not clear. Is it okay? Try again. Hello? Kindly go to a big metropolis. <laughs> He's gone. Okay, so now Navinji, you have to. Ajirji is clean bowl. Now you have to face the bowling. Hmm. Sorry, about all, sorry about all this cricket language. People from. Uh, other do, you, do you hear me? Yes, Ajirji. Kindly show your face, Navinji, if you're uh, speaking. What? That will be good. We don't want to look at a rectangle. Uh, oh. Okay. What is okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, your voice is just cracked, is, has gone. Let's see if Naveen can say something, then you can try later. We'll see if it works. Huh, Naveenji? Yeah. Face your adversary. I think uh, my battery is a bit down, so I'm switching off the video. Okay. I just want to get the understanding when okay. Vishad is saying direct realization, what does it really mean? What is it? Direct perception of wisdom, of, uh, direct perception of emptiness. The direct perception huh? of emptiness. Non-inferential direct perception of direct emptiness. Direct perception. Of emptiness. Yeah, direct perception of emptiness. Of what? If he is talking of the mind, oh. it is very clearly stated that even the clear light mind is also empty of, is empty. And that is why it's, it is said that at that stage, when one is realizing the emptiness of the clear light mind, it is just like the space meeting the space meeting the space or the water meeting the water all these dualities disappear it is just the emptiness so Ajiji, my question is uh, let's say I'm sitting here right now and I'm looking at this laptop huh? I think uh, I can't really hear you oh dear he's saying take the example that he's uh, hmm. that uh, Vishad Bhai is sitting here and looking at his laptop, yeah. okay, he's, he's yeah. looking at his laptop. And I, I see the, I, I have a direct realization. I, I have the direct view of the emptiness of laptop. And he has a direct realization of the <laughs> emptiness of laptop. Uh, that, that, can it come without? Are you, no? Hold on, he hasn't finished. Are you, can, are you sure? Are you sure that you are having the direct realizations of a uh, 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 laptop? He is. You are seeing it. This is hypothetical. This is hypothetical. Maybe this is hypothetical. Yes, it's a question. He he's not. Saying I think. Uh, I think just to just to put the perspective, you are seeing the laptop directly, and when you keep on analyzing the ultimate nature of the laptop, you find the laptop is not there. Laptop is in fact empty of the laptop. Exactly. At that That's... time, you are seeing that emptiness of the laptop directly. Yes, good. That's not what he's asking. So say he has yeah. come to that. He has come to that stage. He understands. Okay. Then his question. Right. Is... So, so when having is... that, having that, that is the emptiness of the object. Now you come to the subject. There's the mind. If you keep on analyzing the mind, ultimately, even the mind is also empty of the mind but that's not what he's asking he's saying 
what is the nature of the mind what what is it the clear light nature of mind which is observing emptiness yeah na nature of the mind is uh, clear light no doubt on that no so even that clear, clear light, light is also empty or no no his question is maybe it's the wrong question he's asking okay we understand what you say about the object the emptiness of the laptop what mind is observing emptiness of laptop what level of mind what state of mind what level of mind is it the clear light nature of mind it 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 is it is the wisdom it is the wisdom realizing emptiness right and maybe and what is that what is that mind which is the wisdom realizing emptiness what level of mind what is the subjective aspect which the nyingmas are supposed to be so good at and maybe we gelugs are not so good at i'm not sure sorry this is very high that is for most people we'll we'll finish this question soon because it's actually not relevant for many people here probably so let's let's get it over with soon ha ah, navin ji boliye no just to add i think what uh, ajiji is trying to emphasize as well is something which uh, both chokne marapuchi and also my other teacher eric prema kunsen says very clearly that this is rikpa and there is always this instruction that you need to uh, attain realization not once or twice but as many times in a day as possible yes and uh, the way that instruction is given is very clear that it is not like you see the emptiness of an object that is not what they mean when they say rikpa what uh, i understand them as saying is that the emptiness of the subject and the object are, are the one that realization has to happen and that's what uh, uh, they mean by uh, uh, finding realization so once that now we are all talking in a hypothetical situation right where uh, we we are only talking about how it ought to be how it could be even that itself would create a certain conceptualization of the mind when we are trying to achieve this state of realization that is always the case when we hypothet so in some ways what i'm trying to say then is that uh thinking about a laptop and attaining the emptiness of the object though it's a, a very useful strategy in a gelug sense of breaking down uh, ways through which we can do different kinds of meditation it's also probably considered as a false hypothetical that mm -hmm. uh, to attain the uh, to uh, attain the uh, emptiness of the object by itself might not be so productive in this pursuit for realization is what i think the nigmas would say at least some of them yeah i don't know whether i'm more confusing or this leads is, to some clarity the, the question is that uh, we do a lot of let's say somebody is doing a lot of mahamudra meditation and mahamudra meditation is about nature of mind and reaching that state of mind wherein we we actually have we can have the direct sort of experience of how the mind actually is the the truest nature of mind right in that sort of state of mind if if we are look if you were to look at anything any object are we looking at it emptiness emptiness of the object that's what i'm trying to say i understood your question uh, shiv i'm sorry i'm interrupting you but the question is framed wrongly to my understanding because you are still saying if you are looking at something because that's not uh, where you would be is the point anyway you, you would not be framing it as you are looking at it anyway yeah I don't think he means looking at it with your eyes. He, yeah. he means. Sure, sure. I'm. I do. I also don't mean that, Kabiji. I'm talking yeah. about the you, not at the look. Mm. Anyway, this is fruitful, but this is an int, uh, basic teaching that we started with today, and now we've gone into highly advanced level, which uh, is very useful for another occasion. But it might be driving some other people nuts, or they might be wondering. Oh, Nandita is probably chewing her. Uh, fingernails by now wondering what what is happening i don't know about gorav somia ashu sahil uh, or uh, klaus and neil uh, i'm not sure 
but anyway, uh, yeah, this is something, of course, of course, this is important because the Buddha himself said that uh, all of the teachings I've given, all of the instructions are to gradually lead the disciple uh, to an understanding of reality, yeah, to an understanding of wisdom. Because that's what cuts through, uh, you know, the illusion. That's what uh, short circuits the ignorance, which is the cause of samsara. Lack of compassion isn't the cause of samsara directly. Lack of wisdom is the cause of samsara. Uh, so it's the wisdom we need. And of course, to get the highest level of wisdom, uh, omniscience, we need the compassion as well, the great compassion, bodhicitta. Yeah, anyway, thank you folks who've been involved in this discussion. Um, actually, Vishad Bhai has disappeared, and so has Ajirji. So maybe, uh, yeah, anyway. Any other points or questions from people of a more, uh, I would say, easier nature? Yeah, don't ask what was the question exactly, Zalji, it will start the whole thing. It's a very technical question uh, on emptiness. Uh, so I don't think we'll uh, go there right now. Yeah. Yeah. But um, people who are interested, by the way, in the teachings on ultimate truth, there's an excellent book by the by His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, with very, very good questions and exercises at the end of each chapter. It's called um, How to See Yourself as You Really Are. How to See Yourself as You Really Are. And uh, it's written together with Jeffrey Hopkins, who is an excellent uh, teacher, translator for His Holiness the Dalai Lama for many years. This is an excellent book which goes step by step into the, these basic topics, well, not basic topic, into the topic of dependent arising and emptiness, which is the term given to uh, the ultimate uh, truth. Um, so that is worthwhile for people to look at. And uh, these teachings are very deep teachings, and it's important not to misunderstand the teachings on emptiness or voidness, because um, they can lead to people getting rather nihilistic, thinking that, well, or it looks like these teachings are saying that nothing exists, uh, whereas that's not what's been said. Uh, things exist, but they don't exist the way we think they exist. This is what's been said. So like that. Yeah. <clears throat> so any questions related to the session we've had today? Uh, on, you know, when I was talking too much, any any feedback related to that? No, okay, nothing. I think people might be tired, right? Or struck dumb by the last discussions. But this is, uh, it all comes down to that. The ignorance creates the habitual patterns. The ignorance makes us not understand and not be able to perform the causes of happiness. You know, the ignorance makes us arrogant. You know? So the the antidote or the whatever destroys ignorance is actually the most important thing. But we have to approach it um, slowly. Uh, step by step, I feel. Uh, and the question that uh, Bishop Bhai asked was uh, rather technical and difficult. So, um, yeah, we need to go step by step. That book I mentioned is very useful. How to See Yourself as You Really Are by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. What else? Nandita, anything? No, Kapirji, I'm so sorry. I joined late and then the Wi-Fi connection was so poor mm -hmm. uh, at my end, of course. And mm -hmm. I'm not well, so I'm retired, hurt in cricketing sorry, terms. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole Indian team is doing badly after yesterday. Ashu ji, Ashu bhai, any, any, any issue, any comment? 
हाँ जी कबीर जी उसमें यही मेरा क्वेश्चन मैंने ग्रुप पे पोस्ट किया कि हैज एनीवन एक्सपीरियंस दैट एम्प्टीनेस एंड शून्यता वाइल मेडिटेटिंग वो कैसा एक्सपीरियंस होता है और कैसा लगता है उस वक्त आई वांट टू आई वुड डाउट इट इफ दे हैव एक्सपीरियंस एम्प्टीनेस बट वी कैन आस्क एनीबॉडी एक्सपीरियंस एम्प्टीनेस नॉट हियर एट द शीता लुक्स लाइक नॉट मी मेबी इंक्लूडिंग यू कबीर जी हां जी इंक्लूडिंग यू no i haven't realized that okay 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 yeah. the question is kabir have you experienced emptiness yeah yeah he's on, I, i'm i'm saying no i haven't experienced emptiness yeah i've i experienced emptiness of my tea cup when it's half full and getting empty then i <laughs> go and make another cup of tea but of course the uh, emptiness in terms of wisdom that i haven't realized yeah okay and Thank i you. guess that nobody else here may have but um yeah also people who have realized them i've never known any of them go around say actually directly i have realized them even the dalai lama says i've studied it for many years and i'm beginning to get an, a good understanding of it but they don't go around saying i've realized it so i say nahi karte we are not uh, you know in this tradition we are not supposed to show off any realization or powers or anything like maybe in other traditions some people think they are very smart and can make a lot of money you know by saying i i can do this i can do that uh bodh dharm mein tibet ke parampara mein aise nahi karte ji sir ji i i know sir uh, shraman shraman traditions we are not allowed to show exactly exactly yes not the be in private discussions between student and teacher some things can be spoken but they would not be spoken in public obviously you know uh, from somia is the antidote to ego and self identification the realization of emptiness exactly somia exactly that is the uh, best the ultimate uh, answer to ego and self identity yeah is then we realize what a patchwork this so called i is that there is nothing solid or independent about it it's a patchwork of uh, hopes expectations fears memories wants anger so many things uh, but and out of that and out of the uh, perceptions and all of the mental factors we have carved out some kind of real i me mind but actually it's just an amalgam of many many different things coming together very impermanent in nature changing moment by moment yeah out of which we have created through ignorance something very solid is there there's something very solid there which has to be uh, you know which can be somehow grasped that uh, and which is me yeah so emptiness is the direct uh, the emptiness destroys self grasping ignorance compassion does it helps but it doesn't destroy it wisdom destroys it specifically which wisdom not the wisdom of understanding karma not just the wisdom of understanding some gross level of uh, interdependence or cause and effect no wisdom realizing emptiness destroys it yeah thank you good question makes it clear at least what the role of emptiness is yeah in a sense neil oh, oh, gora editor we have three four more minutes not much yeah then we'll dedicate so that's good for today tomorrow uh, there's a uh, puja i'm not sure which puja we have tomorrow i have to check the uh, schedule and we'll post it of course but uh, what did we do last week um, anyway there'll be a puja tomorrow tuesday and uh <clears throat> that will be posted and then thursday we'll continue with this topic yeah so we can dedicate which means that we've created some positive energy here that we referred to at the beginning uh when we motivated we spoke about 
the very unusual and very beneficial nature of what we're doing together. And then we engaged in uh, the session with as much uh, energy or interest and sincerity that we could uh, muster. And so there's some goodness has, uh, has, has arisen, some positive energy. So we can dedicate that to the uh, fulfillment of the wishes of all of our great teachers that uh, uh, the dharma lasts for a very long time, authentic teachers. The teach it also lasts, that we never be separated from those authentic teachers and teachings, that all those teachers have long and healthy lives, all their wishes be fulfilled, that all war uh, and uh, disease and famine and so forth, and uh, environmental degradation, which is all of these things which are making life uh, very most miserable and suffering for sentient beings. Uh, all these things uh, stop, cease, become less problematic. May we uh, have the courage to work towards the betterment of uh, this world and have the courage to help, the, help one another, not become uh, bogged down in laziness and uh, you know, callous disregard for others. May that not happen. May uh, Lama Zubrimbache uh, quickly return in unmistaken reincarnation. <clears throat> may all the people we know who are sick and ill, may they quickly recover from their sicknesses. May we uh, have uh, motivation and always the uh, means, the uh, facilities to engage in our Dharma practice. And may uh, great compassion, bodhicitta, and emptiness uh, uh, be developed in our minds so that we can be a great and greater benefit to others. And ultimately, may all our efforts lead to the great awakening of Buddhahood. So everybody, thank you so much, very much, the people here at the Shita, people online, very kind of you to join in, and uh, hope to uh, see some of you tomorrow and some of you on Thursday. So have a very good evening and uh, a very good night. <laughs>